Welcome to another episode of Office Hours. I receive a lot of unusual questions. And um, in fact, there's a funny story here. Um, one of my former students one time called me all the way from across the world once, in fact, from the United Arab Emirates, and said that they were driving back from work and they had a question about something. And they thought they would search it on Google, but then they thought, why bother when they could call me? <laughs> and so then this former student of mine proceeded to ask me what stoicism was, and we ended up having an interesting discussion. So um, today's question actually is a rather peculiar one. Um, and I'm not really sure I have an answer, but I'm going to do my best. So the question which uh, I received was, uh, why is the direction of the tawaf counterclockwise. So just by way of explanation, the tawaf is part of the rites of the pilgrimage to Mecca that Muslims perform. The pilgrimage is of two kinds, the lesser pilgrimage and the greater pilgrimage. The greater pilgrimage is known as the hajj and the lesser pilgrimage is known as the umrah. The hajj can only be done a certain time of the year in the lunar month of Dhul Hijjah. But the point is that in both forms of the pilgrimage, the Kaaba, which is the cubicle structure, which marks the direction or toward which Muslims pray is walked around in these pilgrimage rites seven times. And the direction in which one walks in a circle or circumambulates, this circumambulation or tawaf in Arabic, is done counterclockwise. So if you imagine, if you're walking around the Kaaba in a counterclockwise direction, what that means is, counterclockwise as seen from above. So if you had a helicopter or a drone flying above you, then the direction would that it would trace out would be a counterclockwise direction. That's what is meant. And when you walk counterclockwise around the Kaaba or anything as seen from above, then the thing around which you are walking, the axis around which you're circumambulating will always be on the guess on the left on the left and if you were walking um clockwise as seen from above it would be on the right so the question is why is it counterclockwise and not clockwise now it might interest you to know uh, that there are um rights of walking in a circle around some sort of a sacred object or a precinct, whether it be a mountain or a temple or what have you in other religions as well. So, for example, in the Indian tradition, in the Indic tradition, um, circumambulation is done clockwise. And you find the same uh, in Tibet. So, for example, people who make the pilgrimage to Mount Kailash which for Hindus is supposed to be the manifestation in this world of the Lord Shiva, they walk clockwise. It's also interesting that Tibetan Buddhists also go there and they also walk clockwise. So why is that? So I, I thought this was an interesting question, but um, you know, I don't really have an answer. Most Muslims would simply say that, uh, and this is not a matter of dispute, all Muslims, all groups, all schools of Islamic law, you can check any manual of Islamic law of any school. They all say that you walk around the Kaaba when doing the tawaf or this rite of circumambulation from the pilgrimage, whether lesser or greater, you go counterclockwise. <laughs> so it just comes down to the practice of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. But I will try to offer by way of a kind of um, conjecture or hypothesis a reason for this. And we find this discussed, interestingly enough, by the great uh, traditionalist scholar and savant René Guénon. So Guénon, and I've done a really long uh, video podcast with my friend Habib Shahbazi on this, uh, the Red Sulfur podcast, and hopefully we'll be doing another episode of that very soon, which will go up on the Patreon page. But René Guénon was a traditionalist with a capital T, uh, an eminent scholar of, of the uh, religious and spiritual traditions. One might say that he was truly involved in comparative religion uh, in the true sense, in the esoteric dimension. And so he has this fascinating book actually on the Chinese 
tradition called the Great Triad. And this is the Sophia Perennis uh, uh, edition. So all of his works have been published by this publishing house. Sophia Perennis, Hillsdale, New York. Um, yes, 2004. It first came out, second edition, 2001, second impression, 2004. And this is a translation of the work that appeared in French, La Grande Triade, um, by Editions Gallimard, 1957. So he has a discussion of this in Chapter 7 called Questions of Orientation. <clears throat> Questions of Orientation. <clears throat> so why one particular religious tradition walks in a, in, a, in, in a particular rotation and the other religious tradition walks in the opposite direction of rotation <clears throat> is a question of the symbolism of orientation. So Guénon says something very interesting <clears throat> in this regard, in the opening paragraph of this chapter, a portion of which I would like to share with you. It appears on page 46 of this work. In the primordial age... Man was in perfect equilibrium with himself as to the complementarism of yin and yang. Now, this is a reference to the principles of uh, light and dark, or actually, in, we should say dark and light go in order, feminine and masculine <clears throat> in the ancient Chinese tradition, in the ancient Sinitic tradition, if you like. In the primordial age, man was in perfect equilibrium with himself as to the complementarism of yin and yang. On the other hand, he was yin, or passive, in relation to the principle alone, with a capital P, and yang, or active, in relation to the cosmos, or to the totality of manifested things. He therefore naturally turned toward the north, which is yin, as toward his proper complement. So there is this idea in Guénon and other <clears throat> traditionalist thinkers that the universe has undergone, the cosmos is going through various uh, cycles. There's a notion of cyclical time. <clears throat> and there was the first age, and there are four ages, and we're in the last, the fourth age, the so-called Kali Yuga, according to this view. But in the first cyclical age, which in, in, for the Greeks would correspond to the Golden Age, and now the age of Kali, which in the Greek tradition they would call it the Iron Age. But in the Primordial Age, man was in a state of spiritual harmony and equilibrium relative to the principle with a capital P. In Islamic tradition, we would say the, the, um, the undifferentiated, uh, uh, you know, divine unicity as opposed to al-alam or the cosmos, the totality of manifested things. <clears throat> so, um, so in this primordial relationship, primordial man would therefore, he says, naturally turn toward the north, which is yin, as toward his proper complement. In contrast, as a result, Genon continues, of the spiritual degeneration that corresponds to the descending course of the cycle, the man of later ages has become yin in relation to the cosmos. He must therefore turn to the south, which is yang, to receive from it the influences of the principle complementary to that which has become predominant in him, and to re-establish as far as possible the equilibrium between yin and yang. There's a little bit more. The first of these two orientations can be called polar, in other words, the primordial one, while the second is properly is properly solar. In the first case, facing the pole star or summit of heaven, man has the east on his right and the west on his left. <clears throat> In the second case, facing the sun at its meridian, he has the east on his left and the west on his right. <clears throat> and this provides an explanation for a peculiarity in the Far Eastern tradition that might seem quite strange to those who do not know the reason for it. that last sentence wasn't relevant but <clears throat> to our purposes. But that is how 
Genon explains it. And so you find in a lot of these ancient traditions, like the Indic tradition, they're walking in the clockwise direction. Tibetan tradition walking in the clockwise direction. Even for the ancient Egyptians, the direction of the south held a very important symbolism, and we see this in the orientation of ancient Egyptian monuments, especially the pyramids. And as to the question of orientation when, when, when going around sacred objects, Genon says, concerning the direction of the ritual circumambulations in different traditional forms on page 50, it is easy to see that this direction is determined either by polar or solar orientation, and in the sense that he already explained. So the first direction, or the polar orientation, is that of the stars circulating around or about the pole, now I'm on page 51, when one looks north. On the other hand, the second, in other words, the clockwise rotation or sacramambulation, the second direction is that of the sun's apparent movement for an observer facing south. The circumambulation is accomplished in the first case, the polar case, with the center continually being on the left, as I said with the Kaaba, and on the right in the second. In the Indic tradition in Sanskrit, this is called Pradikshanam, or Pradakshina, but it's correctly pronounced Pradikshanam. And this last mode, Genon says, uh, the clockwise circumambulation, is what is found in the Hindu and Tibetan traditions, while the other is found primarily in the Islamic tradition. So in the light of the observations of René Genon, I would say <clears throat> that since Islam is a tasdiqun lima bayna yadaykum, the Qur'an, or Allah says in the Qur'an that that uh, Islam, this Qur'an, is a, is a confirmation of what has come before. And inasmuch as Islam identifies itself, as clearly stated in texts of the Qur'an, with Ibrahim alayhi salam, and that Ibrahim was neither Jewish nor Christian, but was uh, a Hanif, a primordial Muslim, there is a notion of a return to this primordial equilibrium what the Taoists would call the uncarved block. And as such, the symbolism which must prevail in Islam with regards to the circumambulation must be a polar one. And therefore, the direction of the tawaf or the circumambulation, the sacred rite of walking in a circle around the Kaaba, which is believed by Muslims to be the very first temple the very first space consecrated to the worship of God on the planet Earth, it too must follow a solar, excuse me, a polar orientation. Now, in this regard, besides the great work of René Guénon entitled The Great Triad, which is a very illuminating work, in the context of the Islamic tradition, I must point out and highly recommend the work of Henri Corbin, the uh, man of light in Iranian Sufism, um, in particular, the very first chapter, which is called Orientation, and it has two sections, the Pole of Orientation and the Symbols of the North. It's very interesting. And with regard to the actual symbolism of the Kaaba and its structure and its orientation, uh, they're very profound Observations by Al-Qadi Sa'id Muhammad ibn Muhammad Mufid Al-Qummi in his commentary on the Kitab al-Tawheed by Shaykh al-Saduq. Uh, Al-Qadi Sa'id Qummi died in 1107 of the Hijra. So his book Sharh Tawheed al-Saduq is very important. And this is volume one of three. But if you don't read Arabic, <clears throat> once again, uh, Henri Corbin, in his beautiful book, Temple and Contemplation, offers a summary presentation, in fact, a magisterial one, of the configuration of the Temple of the Kaaba as the secret of the spiritual life. That's chapter four, and it draws entirely from this work of Qadi Sa'id Qummi. So I strongly, I highly recommend all of these works if you're more interested in this subject. And so, the answer then to the question of why one walks in a counterclockwise direction around the Kaaba, besides the fact that that is the established Islamic practice, it is offer, I offer it as a hypothesis 
that it is because Islam as a reaffirmation and return to this primordial tradition upholds the primordial symbolism of the polar orientation and therefore the clock counterclockwise circumambulation and Allah knows best wallahu alam thank you